All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being in the same room with me for a few minutes. Um, I want to talk about how to get to Mars. Uh, maybe not exactly in the way you're thinking of. Let's see if I can get my special effect to work. Ha, huh, there it goes. How to get more of us to Mars. Um, and what I mean by that, I, and, and why I really like this picture, <laughs> is because I read a long time ago that when the Russians were beating America at everything in the early space race, they sent the first two-man crew and then they sent the first three-man crew, but the way they did it was they used the same spaceship that they sent the two-man crew in, they just crammed in another cosmonaut. So the solution is not always about the hardware, uh, which I really like. There are other ways to uh, get more of us to Mars. Some of the, well, there's three main issues, I think, that would-be spacefarers face. Who gets to go? Oh, this is back when we traveled into space on lawn chairs. Um, who gets to go? What's the sele who selects the people that get to go? What selection criteria are used? What are the categories of people, you know, besides the spaceship pilot? How do we make it happen? And by that I mean, uh, is there a certain modicum of training that is required for everybody? Who provides the training? Who pays for the training? And finally, the big, big, big question, how much? Trip to Mars, 10 cents, I wish. Um, not going to be that cheap. So when we talk about how much, not only the cost of the ticket, the cost of the preparation, the expenses of the journey, the expenses you run into once you get to your destination. So my, my overriding question here is with all of the new things coming online, bigger rockets, more distant, places to go, more reasons to get on board. What is it going to take to get the average Joe or Jane to Mars? That's a big question, and that's a question I want to address. Uh, first of all, looking at the current situation, if you want to go into space right now, and as more than a parabolic tourist, you know, just up and down, uh, your options are very limited. These are the only places that are launching astronauts into orbit right now. Um, if you want to do the parabolic flight, uh, multiple locations, uh, you'll have to check with the provider for that. Launch types. The only people that are going into space these days are state-sponsored space professionals, and I mean astronauts, cosmonauts, taikonauts, that's the Chinese astronaut, and viaconauts, that's the Indian astronaut. Uh, there's probably some other knots that I just don't know about. Uh, and parabolic tourists. Did you know you can get married on a parabolic space flight? Upside down wedding. So that's what's happening now. If you want to do it one of those two ways, well, you can try to become an astronaut, but your odds are not great. This year, 18,300 applied, 12 were chosen. If you want to do the parabolic tourist thing, uh, you can do it. It costs about $5,000. I think zero, zero G might be the only provider. It's the only one I know about in this country. There might be others elsewhere in the world. Right now, these are the only places you can go in space. Low Earth orbit on the International Space Station, or if you go up and back down, you're approaching and or reaching the Kármán line, which is the arbitrary divider where we say space begins uh, 100 kilometers or 62 miles up. What's changing all of this? Uh, billionaires oogle Mars. I found this article online. As billionaires oogle Mars, the space race is back on. So Mars is making a huge difference in what is going to happen in terms of space travel, space farers. Using today's technology, to upset the balance of power in space exploration. And this is the part that actually concerns me a little bit, and possibly even redirect humanity's future. Would you like to have the power to redirect humanity's future? Well, I call the people that are going to make this happen Richie Rich Rocketeers. They go by other names. Astropreneurs. And do you know this one? Unwees? Anybody know what an unwee is? Yeah, there they are. Ultra high net worth individuals. Those with at least 30 million in assets 
preparing, pioneering the journey into space. Um, they're worth a lot of money. Uh, this is their 2017 net worth in billions of dollars. I put it up there basically to compare it to NASA's annual budget for everything, uh, which is less than uh, what Elon Musk is worth right now. But they're building, this is what they've come up with so far, big ship, big, big spaceships. Um, there's another one. None of these have flown yet. But as I started to follow this, you know, all the advancements in rocketeering, um, I realized that there's one thing all of these ships have in common. They all have seats. And I started to wonder, you know, how do you get a seat on one of these spaceships? What is the process? And how much does it cost? Uh, become a NASA astronaut, that's the interior of the Orion. Contact us for pricing information, that's Blue Origin. 250,000 question mark, but when uh, Virgin Galactic gets back into space, that's maybe what they're going to charge. And I read, if you want to take a ride to the space station on the Dragon, it might cost as much as 20 million. So, resources most of us don't have. Uh, so my question is, do any of these people have any chance getting into space anytime soon on anybody's rocket? I'm not so sure about that. I asked the question to some of my contacts um, in the space world. This is what I got back from the person I know at SpaceX. Unfortunately, this is information that is not publicly available at this time. So I did some searching around online, and this is pretty much what's publicly available. It's a comparison chart, chart for the various providers, what their destination is at present, what kind of preparation you need to go on their rocket ship, and what is the cost. Um, so you can look at that for yourself. You can see that there's only two Mars intended <laughs> missions, uh, and the only ones that are actually active right now are the NASA going to the International Space Station, not launching, but sending astronauts, and the Zero Gravity Corporation uh, sending people up on parabolic flights for about 5,000 a pop. Things are changing though, big changes coming soon. Uh, NASA's commercial crew program, which is going to put um, NASA trained astronauts on commercial rockets, commercial spaceships, uh, probably going to happen, well, they're saying next year. So next year's going to be a big year for all kinds of things. Um, in addition, there are also a growing number of providers who are offering astronaut training to anybody. So if you want a chance to become an astronaut and you aren't going to go and work for NASA or any of the, the state-sponsored space agencies, you can get your astronaut training privately. Um, the guy is holding a certificate and he's smiling because he just got his FAA certification. The federal, what does FAA stand for? Federal? Yeah, those guys. They're, uh, they're overseeing this whole idea of commercial astronaut training. Other things are happening. Future space fairs. 2018 is supposed to be the year of the space tourist. A lot of things happening in terms of space tourism. We could very well be witnessing the birth of not only a new era, but also a new type of space traveler altogether, the pure passenger. Do you heard of the pure passenger? It's the person who just gets in a rocket ship and just sits back and relaxes. Sits way back if they're going through the G-forces, you know, but they, just, they don't do anything. They have no, no duties, no responsibilities. Um, unless there's a space emergency. <laughs> and a true astronaut's knowledge is overkill on a self-flying craft into, unless it's not. And at that point, you just have to hope Wonder Woman shows up to, uh, to help people out. The other thing that's coming online pretty soon in terms of space tourism, uh, lunar exploration. The next big market we're seeing is the lunar market. You've heard about the mysterious couple that gave Elon Musk a big deposit, right? To fly around the moon. So that's supposed to happen. New destinations. Besides uh, the ISS, we are going to have commercial space stations happening pretty soon, not only around Earth orbit, but moon orbit, maybe Mars orbit. Um, Lockheed Martin is doing, I think it's called the Mars, what is it called? 
the Mars Base, Mars base Camp, the, or, the orbiting space, um, space station around Mars. So new places to go, moon bases, Mars outposts, all of these are future destinations. In terms of getting there, in terms of being a part of this, um, like I said at present, you have to be a space professional or a space tourist. Space professionals get lots of training. Space tourists pay lots of money. And what I'm saying is there's lots of space in between. So I think what we really need to do is develop some new categories of spacefarers, people that are ready and prepared and can go into space. Now, why does Mars matter so much for all of this? It matters because it's, um, it's, it's currently in question as whether we're going to treat it more as a journey or whether we're going to treat it more as a destination. NASA seems to think it's going to be a journey. So we might go up, we might go around and come back, we might land, stay for a short time, come back, but more emphasis on the journey. I think what's more important is the whole idea of eventually uh, putting down roots on Mars, either uh, originally, first of all, an outpost and then growing settlements that grow into whole colonies or Mars communities. Uh, someone who agrees with me, Buzz Aldrin, did the pilgrims on the Mayflower sit around Plymouth Rock waiting for a return trip? They came here to settle and that's what we should be doing on Mars. So I think Mars matters a lot, especially in terms of people who are gonna stay there because the minute you touch down, the minute you land on Mars, you, you have a whole different orientation. You have a whole different set of responsibilities. What it takes to survive along the way on the journey is gonna be totally different than what it takes to survive once you're on the ground. So new kinds of training, new kinds of categories of people. We need to develop people who are gonna be prepared to not only go to Mars, but to stay there for a fairly long time. So who are these people? I think what we need to do is think about different kinds of people that we may need on Mars. Students, educators, scientists, researchers, adventurers, artists, dreamers, workers, immigrants, civic leaders, other professionals, Dot, dot, dot. That means there's a lot more. Those are just the ones I thought of. Um, so we're on our way, I think, to evolving uh, additional categories of people and trying to figure out how exactly these people would be prepared to go to Mars and who's going to pay for all of this. We have evolved somewhat since the Mercury program. The very first astronauts who were chosen uh, they had to be a military jet pilot. And some people say that was for convenience sake uh, because it immediately cut through a swath of people that wouldn't be qualified and gave you a small group from which to choose the first astronauts. Uh, but it also eliminated a lot of people from being able to even be considered, uh, certainly uh, minorities, people of color, women, because they couldn't be military jet pilots. That was 1959. Um, almost 20 years later, NASA came up with another idea which was to introduce the concept of a mission specialist, realizing that everybody didn't need to fly the damn spaceship any longer. You could have other duties on board. So this enabled uh, the first women to get on the spaceship, like Sally Ride, this is Nicole Schott, uh, the first African-American, Ron McNair, to be an astronaut. So it opened up the whole idea of going into space to a much larger category of people. Also, because we had mission specialists, it became more of an international effort, like people from, for instance, South Africa, Canada, Japan, Italy, and many more were able to go and be a part <coughs> of the spacefaring effort. It also opened up the door to the first space tourists who were willing to pay a lot of money. I'm, they're called billionaires sometimes. Uh, but also, and this is a kind of bizarre story, do you know about the woman on the right, Helen Sharman? Anybody know about Helen Sharman? She's hardly known. She was the first British person in space, and she got there by winning a lottery. <laughs> yes, she got there by winning a lottery and spent, I think, 11 days on the Mir uh, spacecraft. 
So, you know, some people have found really unusual ways to get into space. None of that works anymore. They aren't, they're not even taking billionaires anymore because they're, they're, they really need to reserve the seats for uh, their trained astronauts. Um, the organization that comes closest to actually having, well, they do have a commitment to diversity in space, bless their hearts. Yeah, I know they've struggled. We still don't know if they're going to make it. But Mars One, uh, the whole idea of selecting astronauts from all over the planet uh, and without specific skills, but saying if we accept you and you make it through all the various rounds of competition, we will train you. Um, you have to give them big points you know, for their commitment to actually making this a, uh, an inclusive and diversified effort. Some people say that we're now entering space 3.0. Um, and what that means is uh, the whole idea is of an, a growing commitment uh, to see how we can really bring the cost down of going into space. Um, like, for instance, advances in rocket and capsule design, <coughs> lowering the price so that people of more modest fortunes are able to afford a ticket. I think, you know, most mo more modest fortunes is still a lot of money, right? <laughs> Here's a, a study that was done a few years ago. Uh, why it really makes sense for the billionaires, the rocket, the, the rich, rich, richy, rich rocketeers, why it makes sense for them to bring the cost down, because as they do, it really, oh, it really uh, increases their customer base. So, what they did with the study was that if a conservative estimate would be the number of people in the world that are willing to spend 1.5% of their net worth. Uh, optimistic estimate, people that are willing to spend 5% of their net worth. And you can see what happens. If the, if, if the cost per seat is 5 million, this is the only people, this is the range. If it, re if it goes down to 1 million, you get this many more. If it goes down to 500,000, Look how many people might do it, you know? So it makes really sense, you know, if you are one of these, uh, um, if you are in, in the business of making rockets and trying to plan trips into space, um, that you work on trying to get the cost down. Now, this is what Musk said a year ago. Like I said, I couldn't get anything out of SpaceX. They said it was all online, and so that's what I use. But of course, he's going to do an update soon, right? He's going to do his 2.0 plan. I did get a response from Jeff Bezos at Blue Origin. Uh, he was very nice. So he's my friend now, in addition to lowering the prices at Whole Foods. Uh, he, he told me this, if we can make access to space low cost, then entrepreneurs will be unleashed. You will see creativity, dynamism. You will see the same thing in space that I've witnessed in the internet for the past 20 years. So I think there's hope. I really think there's hope. I went looking for particulars in terms of people who are also working, besides the rocket, rocketeers themselves, other people that are really working on this idea of a commitment to having diversity in, in space travel. Um, but one more thing I want to say before that. It's not just going into <coughs> space. It's access to the tools that it takes, because we know for every person that goes into space, there's probably 1,000 people on the ground that are helping to make that happen. So we depend on our tools and our tech. And the only problem is that those tools and tech are not always accessible to everybody. Like, for instance, women were not even allowed to look through telescopes this big until the 1960s. Um, the, the first women to do computer coding were not allowed to touch the computer. They had to look at printed diagrams. You know, they, weren't, they couldn't even go in the room where the computer is. So we've made progress. There's Vera Rubin on the left who uh, discovered dark matter. There's Mae Jemison in the middle, the first African-American uh, female astronaut. And that's Vandy Tompkins on the right who drives uh, the Curiosity rover. So we do have more diversity. Uh, on the ground as well as in space, but unfortunately, it's still the exception and, uh, and not the rule. So what are the solutions? Um, this is something interesting I found along the way, and I love it. I, you know, if you just have the idea that, you know, I have a problem to solve. I want to go to space. I can't afford to go to space. How can I think creatively about it? How can I be resourceful? This is a book that was written in 1973, this was 10 years before Sally Ride, 10 years before Ron McNair, 
Uh, there was no diversity in space in 1973. It's a children's book called Blast Off. It's about a little girl named Regina who wants to go into space. So what does she do? She goes to the trash heap and she finds junk and she builds a spaceship out of spare, you know, she recycles junk and makes herself a spaceship, goes into space and uh, says, I'll zoom through sky into space, I'll find new worlds and maybe meet new people, I'll come back and be famous. Isn't that a dream we wanna share? It really is. So, how do we do it? A uh, few things I found when I was doing some research. There's a, uh, an organization called Space Nation uh, their idea is to uh, provide free astronaut training delivered on a smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, you can learn to be an astronaut. And in addition to that, what is very cool, they have a commitment to sending at least one of their trainees uh, into space. And uh, it's going to start February 2018. Space Nation. Another organization I found out about uh, called Space for Humanity is actually gonna give grants to, for space travel. That's specifically what they plan to do. This is uh, from their website. Um, they wanna select a diverse group of non-astronauts to travel, and this is what's really interesting. They're starting low Earth orbit of uh, the moon by 2027, deep space by 2030. I hope the hell they make it, really. And then some things I just thought of. I mean, as long as people are giving grants, you know, we, there should be more grants for artists and scientists who have a reason to go to Mars, who can write a proposal, who can write a research proposal or a creative works proposal. Um, what about branding? You know, they use, it in, they use it in athletics all the time. Why can't we use it on Mars? You know, get, put, put somebody's logo on your spacesuit or your rover and um, go to Mars. Here's something interesting. Crowdfunding. Um, the picture that you're looking at was uh, the fir first successful space-themed Kickstarter campaign. It was in 2010, and the proposal was an effort to photograph Earth from a balloon lofted high into the atmosphere. It was a Kickstarter campaign, and they raised $296 to do it, and they were successful. So where could crowdfunding go in terms of sending people into space? We do study abroad in all of our universities. What if you could study abroad, but you go farther, you know? There's an idea. We already have the structure in education. And I think probably the best one is there's gonna be a lot of uh, skills needed, a lot of jobs on Mars. So if you can't afford to get there, whatever you can do, if you have a skill like farming or teaching or engineering, uh, mechanics, you know, fixing things, you are going to be valuable on Mars. So use that as a way to get there and then show people what you're worth. In conclusion, <laughs> I thought back to when was, the, when was the last time we had absolutely equal access to the heavens, including Mars? Um, probably, you know, these are the ancient Sumerians. These are the ancient Sumerians. And there is a pale red dot. I put it in there. I don't know if you can see it. But uh, yeah, it's back when the, all we could do was to stand up and look. You know, We all could do it, but we could all do it equally. We got kind of close to it, I think, a few weeks ago for the solar eclipse because everybody who wanted a pair of solar glasses got them. This little guy standing next to me, I love him because he's peeking. He's not supposed to be peeking. I hope he's OK. All right. The plan. Get your ass to Mars. 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 But I think an equally whose ass? <laughs> Who, what are we talking about here? Uh, what we're talking about is just a, really a commitment to thinking positively, creatively, resourcefully about how to get more people to Mars. Um, different ways. Uh, if you go to the, um, the museum in Seattle, what's it called? Popular, museum of Popular Culture, you can sit in uh, Captain Kirk's chair and get your picture made. This is from the film that um, Mary talks about, Alita, Queen of Mars. They made a film out of the novel. And uh, these are the Chinese astronauts. They had seats inside the spaceship too, but those are their outdoor seats. Their patio seating. 
Um, I'm committed to this myself. I just wanted to say briefly, uh, I'm running a project called the Madame Mars Project, and it really is about trying to make future space exploration on the ground and in the air uh, more accessible to all. This is my website. Um, I have some business cards. If you, until they run out, I'll be glad to give them to you. We have a newsletter. We have a feature film, and we're doing a lot of games and apps specifically targeting young people to try to make sure the next generation of space travelers is enthusiastic and ready to go. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Any questions? Or did I say everything? <laughs> yeah. Why did the pilgrim go to a colony in a new world? For a lot of different reasons. But what, where, what are you were, getting were at? Were they wealthy? Were they tourists? No, but they, there were different categories. I think that's, that's actually my point. We're, you know, we're only thinking about professional astronauts and tourists who can pay. And I think we have to think more creatively. And, and those are good examples. Anybody else? Once it, when it's done, it will be distributed on all venues, but you'll have to go to the website because we're still editing. It's, it, it's not done yet. Yeah? When we're looking at job creation, and each person that we send to Mars, what factual jobs are needed to support that organization? What? what? Like if we send for each person uh -huh. we send to Mars. Right. Factual jobs like that, how many jobs to support? Oh. Many, many, many. Yeah, more, you know, more than you could count almost. But that's why I say it's important to have the, the tools and the skills available on Earth you know, and accessible for people on Earth who want to work here to get people to Mars. That's equally important. There's a lot of jobs. I, I'm actually going to the UN in October to, for a whole conference on how do we get worldwide involvement in preparing people to go into space. Uh, October 4th through 6th, yeah. It's actually called Space for Women. So it's trying to make sure, you know, at the UN. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a closed meeting, but in preparation for putting a grand plan together because 2018 is the year of 50th anniversary of using space for peaceful purposes or something like right. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to say men, and I was going to say, mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs.? Fix it. Mr. and Ms. Fix it. Okay. Well, you know, the thing is, when you, the pe first people to go to Mars are going to have to be multi-talented, multi-skilled. Yeah. You're going to need specialists, like medical, like Susan Jewell was talking about in the other room. You're going to need people who have specialties, but, you're, but everybody who goes there is going to have to have a big range of skills and, and expertise to make things work, because it's going to be hard. The, we have to have the robots. We could not go to Mars no, without the robots. Most people yes, yes. Although, you know, a lot of that stuff can be performed remotely, you know, like ch fixing the robot, guiding the robot, you know, so you may not have to be there in person to, de to deal with the robot if something goes wrong. Time? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank